Good morning. morning. Question for you. As a child, what was the first ever song that you remember learning? Anybody? First ever song you remember learning? Anybody remember? Yes. Jesus loves me. Me too. Okay. Now you got the right answer. And then, all right. Anybody remember the second song you remember learning as a child? Anybody? Second song? Twinkle, twinkle. Anyone else? Second song? Jingle bells? Happy birthday. Anyone else? Second song? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that is the book for me. Um, anybody else? Se- Baby Shark. That's good. <laughs> Second song I remember learning, and I don't even know if you're still allowed to teach your kids this song because it may not be politically incorrect, um, but Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black. As, do people still teach their kids that, or is now is it like weird to have... Anyway, um, so, uh, and I think the reason that my parents taught me those two songs first, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and then Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, Jesus loves the little children. I think the reason those were the first two songs I ever was taught is that I, I think that there's nothing more important than really understanding how much Jesus loves you. And in fact, I think there's a reason. Let me show you this verse in Ephesians 3. This isn't our main verse, but this is just a little bonus verse. Ephesians 3, Paul's praying for these folks, and and he says that according to the riches of his glory, he says, I pray for you. I I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power in his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's a whole lot in that verse, but what Paul's big prayer is for this church, he said, hey, more than anything, I'm just praying that God would help you to know how much Jesus loves you. It's beyond comprehension, and that. but if you could get that, then you'd be filled, then, you'd, then you would really be getting everything else. You'd be filled with all the fullness of God. When we get how much Jesus loves us, then we get everything else. And, and so I want to talk to you today. That, uh, and I, I believe that, that Paul prays this prayer is because when I understand the love of Jesus, everything else changes in my life. And I want to talk to you today uh, about four things that change when I understand the love of Jesus in my life. If you have your Bibles, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Woo! 2 Corinthians 5. I want to share with you four things. And this passage that we're going to look at today is one of the most packed passages in all the scripture. We could spend hours and hours and hours and days and days and days looking at all the different stuff in this passage. We're gonna, I just wanna look at it through this lens of the love of Jesus. Share with you four things that happen because of the love of Jesus. Let me show this to you. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 14. Here's what Paul says. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Other translations say, because the love of Christ compels us. When I understand how much Jesus loves me, I will develop this whole new motivation. I will develop this whole new motivation in life. And so what Paul says is he says, the thing that controls me, the thing that compels me, the thing that motivates me is the love of Jesus. Now, now at our house, we have three new little kids, and, uh, and we're not allowed to spank them, Right? Now, whether you spank your kids or not, the, knowing that you could is a liberating feeling, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and so when you have three little kids uh, that you cannot spank by law, um, you, what happens is you begin to learn a lot about human motivation. And you begin to sometimes feel like you're negotiating with terrorists, right? <laughs> Teddy, please come sit down. If not, you won't get dessert. And he's like, well, I don't want dessert. And then it's like, dang it, what's my backup motivator? I don't have something else. Uh, If you don't don't sit down, you'll have to go to bed early. Well, I kind of want to go to bed early. Well, now you're just not sitting. Okay, all right, next next issue. You kind of begin to learn a lot about human motivation anytime you're raising kids. But, But what Paul says is his ultimate motivator is this truth of the love of Jesus in his life. And that word that can be translated controls or compels, I have a little bug flying around on my iPad. Um, someone please call the exterminators. And, uh, but the word compel literally means to hold, hem in, to hold on both sides 
or to, but I like this one, to take away all the other options. And so what Paul is saying is he said, because the, the reality of how much Jesus loves me has sunk deep into my life, it is what controls me, it's what compels me, it's what, mot- it what motivates me. It's absol- he says it's actually removed every other option in my life. Nothing makes sense when, uh, other than, than to respond and to be motivated, compelled, and controlled by this love. Because of the love of Christ, I have a new motivation. And, and, and the thing of it is, is Paul never got over how much, how much Jesus loves him. He, he, if you just kind of, I think it's easy if you've been a Christian for a while, you can, you can begin to just take, have a casual response. It's like if your earliest memories were being told, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. At some point, you can begin to, to lose the wonder of it. But Paul, it seems like he never did. In Romans 8, uh, 35, uh, he says this. He says, but who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or, sore or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelming, overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. What Paul's saying is he's saying, in moments where I don't have any food to eat, in moments where I wonder if I'm even going to live through this, in moments where everybody wants to kill me, he says, but in those moments, I recognize that none of those things can separate me from how much Jesus loves me. And so because of that, I'm okay, is what he's saying. He says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us, what? From the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And see, the nature of the love of Jesus is it's not just a, a, a saying he loves us kind of a way, but it's a proving it kind of a thing. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but, but God demonstrates, God proved, he, he showed his love for us. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone where they had the opportunity to fully demonstrate to you how much they loved you? I mean, I think that in any, every relationship, there's opportunities where people could do little gestures of love and we're grateful. But have you ever had a moment where you're like, wow, I never knew how much they loved me until this defining moment. There were two defining moments in my relationship with Claire. One is Claire and I were uh, first uh, dating and uh, Claire and I were first dating and we weren't super serious yet, but it was headed that way. And, and I got this terrible stomach bug. And I then proceeded to vomit all over my parents' kitchen. And then Claire, like it was nothing, like didn't think twice. And the truth is that Claire vomited, I would have found reasons I had to suddenly leave, right? (laughs) Uh, Because the thing is, if you vomit and I see it and I smell it, I'm about to join you in that party, right? (laughs) And, uh, but I vomit all over my, my parents' kitchen and then Claire just immediately goes and cleans it up with a smile on her face. And I, it was a defining moment where I understood in a fresh way how much she loved me at that moment. And then after we'd been married about 15 years, seven years ago, this month actually, I was super sick. I was at St. Mary's Hospital for two weeks. It was terrible. And, and over that two weeks, Claire, for that full two weeks, just stayed in my hotel room. I mean, my hotel room. I wish it was a hotel room. Uh, uh, my hospital room with me. She would only leave for like an hour and a half a day to go check on our kids. And then she was back and because it was, she, I was on all these drugs and I'm not normally a big crier, but in that moment I was so doped up and felt so sick that if Claire left, I would begin to cry like a three-year-old. It was epic. And, uh, and so she would, uh, and so she was just there 14 days straight, like 22 hours of the day. And at that moment, and every time I look back on it, I'm like, that was a defining moment that eliminated any, that I was like, wow, she, she really loves me as much as one could possibly love another person. And, and, and that's the nature of, of, of the cross that what Paul says, but God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, God didn't say, hey, if you can clean up your act, if you can do the right thing, if you can, hey, hey, then I'll love you and then I'll show you how much I love you. But before, but, but well, while we were, were wretched and doing our own thing, God proved his love for us in Christ dying for us. And Paul never gets over this. And he says, because of that, because of the love of Christ, it, it, it compels me, it constrains me. It's the controlling fact in my life is how much Jesus loves me. It's, uh, he never got over it. He had this, uh, and so let's, uh, let's keep reading here. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. He says, the love of Christ controls us. Why? Because we have concluded that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. He says, he says the love of Christ controls us, and then it gets into a lot of deep theological stuff that we could go into for, for weeks and weeks, but but big picture, what he's saying is he's saying in the, in the gospel, in Christ's death, dying in our place, and, and he's going to, a lot of this is tied to the fact that, that Paul is connecting that, that when Christ died, and because Paul has identified himself with Christ, that in that sense, the old Paul really doesn't live anymore. And he says, and so this, this whole thing of being motivated by the love of Christ is directly tied to this truth that, that Paul's saying that, that in Christ's death, every person who identifies with that, that we also die. So the old Dave and the old Craig and the old Carrie, they, they, no, longer, they no longer live. It's now Christ living in us. And so in that becomes this kind of control motivating, compelling factor in our lives. In Galatians 2, Paul puts it this way. He says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God, but I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So why is the love of Christ this, this compelling, constraining, motivating factor in my life? It's because I'm no longer alive. It's now Christ living in and through me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so because of the love of Jesus, I have this new motivator. It's what motivates me in life. Because of the love of Jesus, I have a new reason to live. Look at verse 15, 2 Corinthians 5. And he says, and he died for all that those who live, those that live in Christ, right? Those that live might no longer live for themselves. But for whom? But for him, who for their sake died and was risen. Because of the love of Jesus, I have a new reason to live. He frees me from selfishness. He, he, he gives me freedom from self-centered living. I no longer live for myself. Our basic predisposition as humans, we're born with this sin nature thing. Our basic predisposition is to live for ourselves. The majority of our thoughts are about ourselves and making much of ourselves. Our time is spent, our, our predisposition when given freedom, when we don't have someone else telling us what to do with our time, our basic predisposition usually is to want to use it to make much of ourselves. Our money, we spend it on, on ourselves. What Paul says, he says, I, I've, I've been set free from this. He says, I no longer live for myself, but now I live for him who died for me. It's, there's this whole change. What he's saying is he's saying Christ, that, that because Christ's love what, what, what led him to the most selfless act of all of the, the world has ever seen. And now that the old us has, has died with Jesus on that cross, uh, but now this new us that's alive because Jesus rose from the dead, we've identified with his death, but now we've identified with his resurrection and that we are alive in Christ, his love for us, uh, and because of his love for us, and now our responsive love for him, the love that we have in response to his amazing love for us controls everything in our lives. And so now my instinct isn't how can I make much of myself, it's how can I make much of him. My instinct isn't, how, my thoughts aren't consumed with myself, but my thoughts should be consumed with him. And the way I spend my time isn't just on myself, it's, it's how can I honor and serve and, and love him. It all becomes about him. I've been set free from self-centered living because of the love of Jesus, because his love led to this ultimate act of selflessness. And, and then he, he, has, he died in this selfless way. And when he died, that there's this sense in which I've identified with his death where the old me's no longer alive. And now I am, am now alive in him and his life and his love are what are flowing through and controlling me. And so I no longer live to make much of myself, but to make much of him. Paul's main point was that Christ died for them and that they all died with him so that those who live through the power of his resurrection should no longer live for themselves. There's no such thing. Uh, you, you can't both be committed to making much of you and making much of Jesus. The follower of Christ has made this decision, saying, I'm no longer going to live for me. I'm going to live for him. And in doing so, we begin to have this, this very clear thing. 
Uh, it becomes this clarifying factor as to who, who belongs to Jesus. It, it, it helps us discern that those who belong to Christ do not live for themselves. Now, do we have moments where we blow it, moments where we fall into that? For sure, but the, pat- the overwhelming pattern and direction of our life isn't to live for ourselves. It's not self-centered kind of thinking. And so in societies like ours that that are based on self-promotion and self-fulfillment and self-indulgence, what should happen is Christians should stand out as distinctively different because the, the, the message of the world is make much of yourself and fulfill all of your desires and fulfill all of your dreams. But, but what the Christian says is he said, it's not about that for me. It, it's the, they all, the, the Christian only lives for Christ. And in doing so, we give up our rights for the good of others and do not insist on having it our own way. A friend of mine on Facebook reposted this quote. I'm not even sure whose it is. And if no one else is going to take credit, I guess I will. And so uh, it says this. It says, at some point, a self-centered calling conflicts with God-centered callings because God-centered callings always lead to a cross. God-centered callings involve suffering, sacrifice, and looking like a fool because this is the path of the Savior we follow. If your calling is about your image or your reputation or your comfort and convenience, it will eventually diverge from the path of Christ. At some point, God will ask you to do something that isn't about you or doesn't feel good or requires you to suffer and you will have to make a choice. So the love of Christ, it leads to this new motivation. The love of Christ gives us a new reason to live. Here's the third thing. The love of Christ gives us a new perspective on people. Look here, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What Paul says is we no longer look at people the way we used to look at people. Here's what he's saying, and this is a profound truth. He's saying, because there was a time that I looked at Jesus wrongly. Paul, who was the, the, you know, the trained rabbi and on his way up the path to be at the heights of, of, of all the Jewish teachers, he says, but when I first heard the teachings of Christ, I thought there's no way this can be the Messiah. And then when he died on the cross, I knew there's no way that he could be the Messiah because the the Old Testament says, cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree, so he's definitely not the one. And he says, I was so sure he wasn't the one that that when people that were following him, I I was so sure they were sinning and doing the wrong thing that I was willing to kill those guys. He says, I was so wrong in how I look at Jesus, but now I recognize that when he was cursed on that tree, he was cursed because he was taking my curse. And he says, I recognize I saw him through the wrong lens and I had the wrong perspective. And he says, and I recognize that that usually when I look at people in my own strength and in my own power and my own perspective, I don't see it how it really is. He says that, but, but because of the love of Jesus, because Christ died for all, because Christ died for all and in his death for all, he's declaring his love for all. And so even though his whole life he'd been taught that that women were less than and slaves were less than and and anyone that wasn't Jewish was less than and anyone that didn't keep up all the rules as well as he does, he says, I've learned my whole life that all of them were less than me and I should look down on them. And in fact, I I should just be glad I'm not one of them, he says. But now I recognize that, that the same love that Jesus has for me, he has for them. The same love that led Jesus to die for me led him to die for them. And so I can no longer no longer afforded the right to look at people through the lens of the flesh. You ever go to the DMV? A couple thoughts about the DMV. One, the DMV is the ultimate equalizer in this life. You ever think about the fact that Bill Gates has to go to the DMV to get his driver's license? Now, you can have a power of attorney go and register your car, and as I spent three hours at the Carson DMV the other day, I thought maybe next time I will secure a power of attorney to go and register this car. But the thing about the DMV that's, that is fascinating is, uh, one, is you see people that you wouldn't normally see. 
we all kind of have our little bubbles where we kind of live our life, and whether it's a Midtown bubble or a South Reno bubble or a UNR campus bubble, we all have our little bubble where we kind of end up seeing a whole lot of people like us. But the DMV, you look around and you're like, this is, a, this is everybody here. But the other thing that makes the DMV fascinating is it is everybody doing their least favorite thing. There are no more angry people in the world than at the DMV, right? And so you're with this diverse population of people all having the worst day of their week. Everyone's mad. Literally saw this old lady almost get in a fight with the lady at the DMV. The center in me is sort of rooting for it, right? Let's see this happen. I'm here. I got nothing else to do. Let's do this. I'm betting on her, right? I'm taking bets from the other folks at the DMV, you know, and but our instinct is to look at people like that, right? And, and, and what Paul is saying is he's saying, I no longer look at people the way I used to. Because here, here's the thing. The, the world looks at people from the outside. The world dismisses or divides people who seem different. The world looks down on those who seem to be less than me or to have less than me. The world gets jealous of those who seem to be more than me or have more than me. The world looks at people as, how do I get something from them? But Paul has come to this conclusion. He's no longer free to look at people through that human perspective. If the love of Christ has been made available to all because Christ died for all, that, that, and, that I'm no, that I, and if it's no longer I who's living, but now it's Christ who's living in me, his love is flowing through me, he's becoming the motivator of my life, then I now begin to look at people as Jesus sees them. I have this new perspective on people. I have to look at people through a new lens. I'm not better than them. They're not different from me, so somehow that I, I, I no longer can have that, I no longer have that right to just look at people through a human perspective, that's perspective that, that wants to create divisions, that perspective that wants to look down on. But I recognize that Jesus died for them just like he died for me, and Jesus loves them just like he loves me. And it's not a matter of what people look like on the outside. It's not a matter of how much they do or they don't have. It's not a matter of how much education they do or they don't have. It's not a matter of what gender they are or what color they are that Christ died. And not even a matter of how messed up their life is, not even a matter of the bad choices they're making, that Christ died for them. In doing so, he proved once and for all that he loves them. And so if that's how he looks at them, that's how I am now to look at them. Here's your last point. Look at verse 19. Because of the love of Jesus, I have a new message and a new mission he said, I've, I've, I've got this ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he's entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. So we have this message that, that, that God desires to be in right relationship with everyone on the planet, and that's why Jesus died, and that's why he rose from the dead. And so Christ said, Paul said that, that now Christ's love, he compels me to bring this new message, and I have this new mission that really gives me a new identity. Let me show this to you. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Sometimes I am tempted to want to drive really, really poorly. I always think, how incredible would it be that if you could drive 140 miles an hour, you get pulled over, and then you declare diplomatic immunity? Have you ever, ever had that fantasy, the diplomatic immunity fantasy? Is it just me? Pray for me. Thank you, ma'am. You also have honesty. Anyone else ever had the, uh, it really is just the two of us. Uh, pray for us. And so, uh, and so I've thought about pulling this, like I get pulled over, going 140 miles an hour, and then I say, hey, I've got diplomatic immunity because I'm an ambassador of Jesus but I'm committed not bringing Jesus into my bad driving. And so that's why, that's why I don't have a fish on the car. Um, but look here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Let me share with you a few things about being an ambassador of Jesus. An ambassador in this culture, just like in ours, an official diplomat, 
that rep represents one country to a foreign country. He's the authorized messenger, representing the message and the mission of the country's leaders, in this context, a king. An ambassador lived, lives in a foreign land. An ambassador le learns a foreign language. An ambassador works to build a relationship with the people of the foreign land. An ambassador is clear where he is from. An ambassador is clear who he is representing. An ambassador speaks the message of the king, not his own message. An ambassador speaks with the authority of the king. And, and so what Paul says, he says, we're Christ's ambassadors. He says, here we are. We're, we're, we're living in our citizenship is in heaven, but we're living in this foreign land. And, 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 and we, we're living here, but our citizenship is there. And we're representing the king and we're bringing the message of the king. We don't get to choose the message. It's the king, an ambassador. And if, imagine if you're the ambassador from America to the United Kingdom, and you just get over there, and you decide, I'm just gonna start just saying what I think should happen. Not what President Trump thinks should happen or the rest of the government. I'm just gonna give my own hot opinions as to, well, that, you wouldn't be the ambassador very long. You, you, would, it's, you bring the message of the king, but the, the, the ambassador speaks with the authority of the king. And so Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. Our citizenship is in heaven, but we're in this other place. But we've been entrusted with this message, and we've been entrusted with this authority. The story is told of George Shultz, who was Secretary of State during the Reagan presidency. He kept a large globe in his office, and when newly appointed ambassadors uh, would come in and, uh, and had an interview with him, he would test them by saying, you have to look at this globe and prove to me that you can identify your country. They would go over, spin the globe, and put their finger on the country to which they had been sent. They never got it wrong. When Schultz's old friend and former Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was appointed ambassador to Japan, he also was put to the test. This time, however, and the ambassador Mansfield spun the globe and put his hand on the United States. He said, that's my country. On June 27th, 1993, Schultz related this to Brian Lamb on C-SPAN's uh, show, a book notes, and he said to the secretary, he said, I've told that story subsequently to all the ambassadors going out. He said, never forget that you're over in that country but your country is the United States. You're there to represent us. Take care of our interests and never forget it. And never forget that you're representing the best country in the world. And I, this same message that God is giving to us saying, you are my ambassadors. You might be living in Reno, Nevada, and the United States but don't forget that your citizenship and your allegiance isn't to the United States. It, it's, it's to the kingdom. And, and that your loyalty isn't to a president or a party or a governor. It's to a king. And his name is Jesus. And so don't ever imagine that, that if you were sent as the ambassador to, to, some, to Costa Rica, and you go down to Costa Rica, you're the ambassador from the U.S. to Costa Rica, and you go down there, and you start to think, I think the people here are nicer than the people in the U.S., and I think the food is better, and I think the beaches are prettier, and someone else here says, they are, never been, and then they begin to think, you know what, I think, I, I think I'm more committed to Costa Rica than I am to the United States. And I think I want their, their objectives to thrive, not the objectives of the, that, that person would be a traitor, right? And I think there's this sense that we all live in this danger of losing sight of the fact that we are ambassadors representing a king with his message and his authority. But it's easy to, even though our citizenship is in heaven, for us to begin to say, you know what? This world is pretty great. And the things of this world are pretty great. 
And I think I value the message of this world as much as I do the message of the king. And I think I want to be under my own authority, not under the authority of, and we can end up no becoming traitorous ambassadors. And so Paul here is saying, he says, that Christ's love, it's given me this new motivation. That, that Christ's love ha- has, has given me a new reason to live. Christ's love helps me to see people differently. And that Christ's love has given me this new message and this new mission. But, but I think that it's easy for us just to lose sight of the wonder of the love of Jesus. And I think one of the greatest things we could do is to, is to meditate on the love of Jesus. And one of the greatest things we can do is to pray that God would help, just like Paul prayed for that church in Ephesus, that they would know just how much God loves them, that, that, that we would know. That's, I pray that for my kids pretty much every day, that they would know just how much God loves them because I believe when we know it, when we really know how much God loves us, everything else in our life begins to change the love of Jesus. The thing about the love of Jesus is is it's a love that'll never stop. Do you know that anyone else that loves you, one day they could stop loving you. And anyone else that loves you, one, one day they could leave this life. That there's no other love that will never stop. It's a love that will never change. It's a love that will never stop. It's a love that knows no limit. Just just when Claire and I were dating, had she vomited, I don't stop, kept loving her, but I don't know if I loved her enough to clean up that vomit in that moment. I still would be terrible at it. I'd probably hire somebody. Um, It's, uh, but the love of Jesus is a love that knows no bounds. It's a love that never stops. It's a love that pursues us when we're not loving him well. Read this cool story of Max Lucado that I think is just a picture of, of the, the way in which the love of God never, never ceases. Let me read it to you. It says, 1989, an 8.2 um, Richter scale earthquake flattened Armenia, killing over 30,000 people in less than four months. In the midst of chaos and destruction, a father rushed to his son's school. But instead of a school, he found a shapeless heap of rubble. And instead of despairing, Instead of giving up, this sight made him spring into action. He ran to the back corner of the building where his son's class used to be, and he began to dig. Why? What real hope did he have? All he knew was was that he had made a promise to always be there for his boy. And as he was digging, well-meaning parents tried to pull him out of the rubble, saying, it's too late. They're dead. You can't help. Go home. There's nothing you can do. Then the fire chief tried to pull him off the rubble by saying, fires and explosions are happening everywhere. You're in danger. Go home. Finally, the police came and said, it's over. You're endangering others. Go home. We'll handle it. But this father continued to dig, not for eight hours, not for 12 hours, not for 26, uh, 24 hours or 36 hours, but after 38 hours, he pulled back a boulder And he heard his son's voice. And immediately he screamed, Armand! Back came the words, Dad, I told the other kids that if you were still alive, you would save me. You promised me that you'd always be here for me. You did it, Dad. When I read that story, I thought, that's a picture of the love of God in Christ this love that never gives up, this love that always takes the next step, this love that is beyond comprehension and that when that begins to sink into our minds and more importantly, into into the depths of our souls and our hearts, it really changes everything else about life. I don't have to go through life insecure when when I know that the God of the universe loves me more than I could ever grasp or comprehend. I don't have to go through life scared when I grasp that the God of the universe loves me more than I ever could comprehend, and and it frees me from living for myself, changes how I look at people. I have this new message. I have this new mission. It is absolutely the biggest change game, game changer in our lives. Let's pray together.
Father, just like the Apostle Paul prayed for that church in Ephesus, that you would give the strength and the power by your Holy Spirit that they might have a fresh glimpse, a fresh grasp, a fresh understanding of your love for them. That love that goes beyond comprehension, that love that is greater than any human love that we could ever experience, that love that is, is not unstable but rather is, un- is an unchanging forever kind of a love that has lasted from eternity past and will go into eternity future. God, I pray that you'd make that so real in our lives. God, that that, that, that would become this defining truth that your love made abundantly clear through so many things, but in the defining moment of the cross, where you took upon yourself all of our sin and all of our shame and everything bad about our lives. And in exchange, gave us all of your perfection and all of your goodness. The greatest display of love imaginable, where you proved once and for all your love for us in a time where we were still sinners living for ourselves. God, would you make that just fresh in our lives that we would have the power to grasp your amazing love for us and that that would become the defining truth in our life, that it would be what motivates us. God, that it would set us free from living for ourselves. God, that it would set us free from looking at people through the lens of snobbery and prejudice and judgment, but that we'd look at them as people that you love so much that you died in their place. That that love would become the message of our lives as we live as your ambassadors, bringing your message under your authority, representing you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.